me <laughs> for sharing. So um, yeah, so maybe I'll start uh, with a, you know, I don't know, a, a, an apology that there won't be any, uh, I don't think there'll be much in the way of representations in this talk, and certainly nothing in the way of modular representations in this talk, but um, I guess, uh, so I'm going to talk about uh, some geometry associated to real Lie groups. And I guess I do want to uh, kind of, um, well, make the kind of comment that I do think some of the geometry is relevant to uh, finite groups, uh, Lie groups of finite uh, characteristic and so on. So it won't be explicit, but I'd be very happy to talk to people who, uh, who are interested in this kind of thematic connection. Okay, so I understood that there was a kind of a, a unique organization to the seminar, which is not always followed. So in any case, I plan to do a kind of part one and then a part two, but I'm happy to do whatever, whatever uh, works for the audience. So let me start right off with uh, some discussion of some geometry, uh, finite dimensional groups and uh, their no potent cones. And I should say from the very beginning that this is all uh, joint work with South Shan Chen, and uh, I think most of what I'm going to talk about is on the archive. I'm going to try to advertise along the way some things we're trying to do. Uh, but in any case, uh, most of it's on the archive. OK, so what's the setup? OK, so just to make sure we're all on the same page. So usual uh, setup. So G is, go G is going to be a reductive group over the complex numbers. And we'll write G for its Lie algebra. And then we have the usual characteristic polynomial map okay, to see the adjoint quotient map. Um, so this is kind of usual characteristic polynomial or Chevalet map. And uh, we'll set as usual n equal to chi inverse of zero. This is the nil potent cone. And I should say that I'm interested in all uh, uh, what do you say, the level sets uh, of chi for at other values as well. But I think the most appealing results happen and the most interesting results happen for the notebook cones. Okay, now uh, I'm going to be interested in this talk in uh, real groups. Uh, sorry, question or? No, okay. So I'm going to be interested in, um, in real groups. So let's from the start, start uh, we'll fix GR, a real form. Okay, and uh, we can say for say a conjugation, let's have some notation for a conjugation eta, okay? And let's pick uh, a commuting conjugation uh, of with uh, a conjugation that commutes with eta and cuts out a maximal compact. So let's have GC inside G be a maximal compact uh, for a commuting conjugation uh, delta. Okay, and now let me organize a kind of uh, picture. So we have, first we have a symmetric subgroup, symmetric subgroup uh, cut out by the composition, the involution given by eta of delta. And let me just draw a kind of diagram that organizes all this. It's good to keep in mind. So we have G, we have GR, okay, and then we have uh, GC, K, and then if we take the intersection of any two of these, we have KR, maximal compact inside of K. The maximal compact, I guess, inside of K and also inside of, of uh, GR. Okay, so um, okay, so this is the, the setup for much of the talk. And uh, let me see if there was anything else I wanted to say. And as, yeah, maybe one more comment about setup, which is that if we take the Lie algebra G, we get a decomposition into the eigenspaces of theta. So we can write G as the Lie algebra of K. So this is where theta acts as positive one plus uh, P where theta acts as negative one. Okay, so, um, so now let me just remind you of an important theme. Okay, so an important theme that I don't know if it's originally due to Harish Chandra, but it certainly uh, carries his name. And that's the idea that the representation theory and geometry, representation theory and the geometry of GR, of the real form, should be equivalent in some meta sense to the representation theory and geometry of the pair 
in the algebra of G and subgroup K. Okay, so we should always be able to understand any question on either side of this divide. And let me mention something that I think is interesting about what I'm going to try to present, which is that uh, I think the typical way this dictionary goes is that you ask a question about uh, GR, about a real form, okay, so a group over a non-algebraically closed field, and then you're happy to answer it in terms of the algebra of GK, of the GK module. But in this talk, I'm gonna try to present two places where one can reverse this uh, flow of information. So kind of two places where geometry of the real form is gonna help us understand some symmetric geometry. Okay, so, um, so let me give an example of this, uh, example of this theme. So an example of this theme due to constant Sekiguchi. Okay, so an example of this theme, which is the following. So we can look at, on the one hand, we can look at the real nilpotent cone. Okay, so this is uh, N equals uh, N intersection, the real form GR, okay? So we can look at the real nilpotent cone and look at its GR orbits, okay, set of GR orbits. And this set, okay, maybe I'll write just braces around this to convey that I'm interested in the moment and just in this set. This set is in natural bijection with uh, what we get when we look at N intersection P and look at the K orbits. Okay. So in fact, so in fact, this is a, uh, this is a poset isomorphism. Okay, so this I learned from a paper of uh, Barbash and uh, Sapansky. Okay. And also you can say that it's um, uh, that individual orbits are diffeomorphic. So corresponding orbits are diffeomorphic and this, uh, sorry, David, can I, so the real orbit is that inside of the real D algebra or inside of the complex D algebra? The left hand side is all real. So it's simply the nilpotent cone defined over R. Okay, so the real nilpotent cone. So okay. for example, if G is uh, SLN, then the left hand side is the real N by N traceless nilpotent matrices, mm -hmm. modulo SLN R. Okay, thank you. Okay, yeah, thanks, thanks, Roger. Um, okay, and orbits are diffeomorphic. This is uh, due to Verne and building on work of Kronheimer, who explained that, uh, you know, how no potent orbits have hyperkähler structure. Okay, so, um, so the first result to motivate what I'd like to talk about is uh, the following theorem. So theorem, this is with Cao Xian. So the theorem is, let's assume, so let me give myself a little more room. So let's assume that uh, G is of classical type. And I'll explain later why we, our current methods can't, don't, don't go beyond this. They probably apply to G too, but they don't go beyond this. And there's some interesting uh, mysteries still to, to understand. But in any case, let's assume G is of classical type. Okay, then, then there is a KR equivariant stratified homeomorphism, okay, homeomorphism compatible with the orbits of um, between an R and the symmetric nilpotent cone. Okay, so it's a kind of lift, one can say it's kind of lifting, lifting the constant Segaguchi correspondence. Okay, so this was a open question among experts for a long time, whether or not all of the shadows we see that tell you that the geometry of NR and NP look the same, whether these shadows really come from some kind of uh, clean topological statement. And at least for G of classical type, now we, we have the following theorem, which I'm gonna spend a little bit of time explaining. Okay, so let me do an example of this, but I don't know how it works, uh, uh, what the culture is here. I'm quite happy to pause and uh, if there are any questions at the moment um, with the setup and then this first assertion, I'd be happy to address any questions. 
you know, it's a ah, question. No. You know, there's a trick when you teach uh, big classes is that you basically wait silently until someone in the audience gets so uncomfortable that they they have to ask a question. <laughs> maybe, maybe that I don't know. I've tried this now when teaching on Zoom, and and the anonymity guarantees people are just happy to let you suffer in silence. <laughs> so, okay. Um, all right. Let me let me draw a picture of an example of this. Okay. So an example. So let's look at when. Uh, say G equals SL2, okay? So uh, on the one hand, we have on the left-hand side of this uh, homeomorphism, we have um, the real nilpotent cone. Okay, so here's the real nilpotent cone, which is one of the few things that literally, the drawing is literally what it is, okay? So what is this? This is A, B, uh, C, negative A, so that negative a squared minus bc equals zero, okay? And a, b, and c are all, oh, a, b, and c are all real. Okay, so this is a real quadric surface, singular quadric surface. And the theorem tells you, I mean, you don't need the theorem, but in any case, the theorem says in this case that it's homeomorphic to a picture that I unfortunately can't draw because I can't draw four dimensions, but it's a picture of two nodal lines crossing. So here, what do we see? We see alpha, beta, beta, negative alpha. So that alpha, negative alpha squared minus beta squared equals zero. We're here, alpha and beta are complex. Okay, so this is an R, and this is an P. Okay, and maybe it's worth pointing out that this homeomorphism is a kind of a strange beast. I mean, it's got very strange behavior. So for example, if you take one of these lines, then what it gets matched with is one of these components, I don't know, semi-algebraic components. Okay. So this homeomorphism is very far from any kind of algebraic isomorphism. Okay. So it's uh, very strange to state something as a homeomorphism in a conference on modular representation theory, I suppose. But in any case, this uh, we, we've thought, you know, is there a better statement? And we always come back to saying homeomorphism seems to be the, the simplest way to describe this phenomenon. Okay, so um, okay, so that's uh, an example um, of what's what's happening for SL two in this theorem. So let me state a slight, uh, well, not slight, but uh, kind of a generalization of the theorem that's useful in understanding Springer theory. Okay, so um, okay, so a kind of uh, generalization to other. Uh, conjugacy classes. Okay, so let's have some notation. So let's write uh, GR prime and uh, P prime. Okay, these are both inside of G still for the respective subspaces or subsets of uh, GR and P of matrices with um, with real eigenvalues. Okay, so a matrix it can be in GR, but for example, be elliptic and have imaginary eigenvalues. It need not be uh, not have real eigenvalues. And so, what I'm going to discuss is only going to be relevant to matrices that, in fact, have real eigenvalues, as opposed to so they're going to be real matrices or symmetric matrices, but they're going to have to have real eigenvalues. Okay, so with this um, notation, then the theorem, again, maybe I, I will, uh, uh, I don't know. Okay, so not to forget Sao uh, Let me keep writing attributions. Okay, so again, this is under the assumption that G is of classical type or direct sum anyway. <clears throat> then, we have, um, then we have a KR uh, equivariant homeomorphism as above. I mean, we can extend the above uh, equivariant homeomorphism to GR prime and uh, that's why I write P prime. Okay, and it's compatible with the characteristic polynomial map phi. Okay. So, um, so just to let me enhance the pictures I drew above to kind of illustrate so example, so back, back to SL2, okay? So now when I 
draw the null potent cone, I'm not only interested in the null potent cone, I'm also interested in these other conjugacy classes. And here there are two types of hyperboloids I could draw. I could draw the hyperboloids of one sheet or the hyperboloids of two sheets. The hyperboloids of one sheet are the elements that have real eigenvalues. The hyperboloids of two sheets are the elliptic elements that have um, uh, not real eigenvalues, imaginary eigenvalues. Okay, so in any case, this is one side. And then what do we see on the other side? We see, well, this nodal crossing, and then we see other level sets of some coordinate, you know, alpha times beta. Uh, well, I guess it wasn't alpha and beta, but in any case, some coordinates x and y, x times y equals t. Okay, so this is the kind of homeomorphism. Okay, so um, great. So now what I'd like to do is just discuss, so we kind of just to wrap up or kind of, I don't know, next part of uh, part one is I'd like to discuss just some consequences of this, this result. Okay, so let's discuss some, some consequences for Springer theory. Okay. So, uh, so one corollary, an immediate corollary of this is that we have an equivalence of derived categories. So we can look at the GR equivariant derived category of the real null potent cone, and it's equivalent to the K equivariant derived category of the symmetric null potent cone. Okay. Now, moreover, under this equivalence, we can match the nearby cycle sheaf coming from a regular conjugacy class. So under this equivalence, I can start with a regular conjugacy class under this homeomorphism, I start with a regular conjugacy class and take the nearby cycle sheaf and get a sheaf on the zero fiber. So on the no potent cone, real no potent cone here, or the uh, symmetric no potent cone here. Okay. And so it turns out, I mean, just, well, it's more or less an immediate corollary of this equivalence that we can match these two objects. So on the one hand, we have, um, let's write uh, SR for this real Springer sheaf. And this gets matched with uh, SP, this symmetric Springer sheaf, okay? But it's important to note that the real Springer sheaf has an alternative origin, okay? So the real Springer sheaf, um, so here, here SR and SP, SP arise as nearby cycles. Okay, but it's important to remark that the real Springer sheaf, so SR, also arises as the push forward from uh, the Springer resolution. So also, uh, also arises via the real Springer resolution. So the real Springer resolution, uh, let's write mu from n tilde r to n r. Okay. So in the usual way in Springer theory. Okay, so this uh, realization is very, is much easier to work with than the nearby cycle sheaf. Okay, so, so for example, so um, one can, using this realization, one, oh, my iPad froze. Okay, give me a second here. Let me, I'm gonna stop sharing and then just reshare since I think that might help. Okay. Okay. So, um, Okay, so one can calculate uh, the endomorphisms, let's give it a name, uh, HR, the endomorphisms of SR using this realization. Okay. And <clears throat> as a consequence of this, one can give a much simpler proof of a theorem of Grinberg. So Misha Grinberg calculated the endomorphisms of this nearby cycle sheaf and um, 
discovered that it was equal to this HECA, this HR. Okay, so this HR is something like it's a specialization of the HEC algebra. And um, so he calculated long ago that the, the SP, the nearby cycles uh, in the symmetric case, has this as endomorphisms, but one can now give a kind of more direct proof calculating the endomorphisms from the Springer resolution. So we can, uh, so one thing I found satisfying about this is recover a uh, calculation of, uh, well, cal the calculation that HR is also isomorphic to endomorphisms of this uh, calculation of Grinberg. David, that's, is it a, it's Hecker algebra minus one, is that right? That's, yeah, uh, in the split case, it's the Hecker algebra minus one. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, I don't know whether to call it a spike set specialization because I have in mind the split case, but if you're, so it, it's defined by a formula where Q is equal to either, uh, Q is like a product of signs depending on how many reflections fix a, very, you know, a, a given simple root and so on. So, okay, I just don't know much about it. So maybe it is this, a standard, uh, has this kind of, standard realization as a specialization, but um, okay, yeah. So in the split case, it's, um, it's, it's the specialization of minus one. Um, so yeah, so one comment maybe that's worth making, which is, is that, um, you know, this, this version of Springer theory, these guys are, uh, you know, not, I don't know what one says, not at all semi-simple, <laughs> okay, so this is really not, these are, you know, not behaving uh, as one might expect Springer theory to behave in, you know, if you were familiar with the complex case. So these are very, really, really complicated sheaves. And so calculating their endomorphisms is, uh, has its own kind of uh, challenge to it. Um, okay, so I think, let me see if I want to. Uh, just yeah, take question. Question. Uh, does the Springer sheaf on the right-hand side, uh, uh, does it exhaust all the equivalent sheaves on your button cone in a given block? Um, so, okay, so there's several things to say first. So I'm not an expert on this. So the first thing to say is that here we're in a situation where there are in fact interesting local systems on a regular conjugacy class. So a regular conjugacy class here uh, may, you know, may not be simply connected or may at least have interesting equivariant local systems. So already there's a generalization of this theorem that I didn't set, state, which is this is true if you start with any such local system. So you already have many, many more local systems. Um, I don't know, okay, yeah, I don't know the answer to your question, except to say already one has to at least add those local systems to. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so what is the uh, definition? Uh, is constructed from nearby sites. So just, just in the case of SL2, yeah, uh, so, so in the case of SL2, where literally the pictures here, I take, you know, this, um, uh, let's see, so this, this uh, space is, uh, has coordinates alpha beta, uh, and I think we're looking at, if you go back up to here, I had negative alpha squared minus beta squared equals zero, so here I would look at something like negative alpha squared minus beta squared equals t, or maybe t squared, I, I, let me not try to, but probably t. And now I take, I take a non-zero value of t, take the constant sheaf, and take its nearby cycles. Yeah, so, so which sheaf do you get uh, on, on it? So, so here I had in mind, when I wrote sp and sr, nearby cycle sheaf, I had in mind uh, you start of the constant sheaf. Yeah. yeah but so you, you could also consider or other you know, local systems. Maybe I'm missing your question, but that that's that's yeah. what I had in mind. I had in mind starting. So, with so it's a semi-simple complex on uh, Neopolitan cone. No, it's not semi-simple. So oh, you know, simple. let's do. Let's just oh. explain what it is. Uh, so I made this comment that it's it's uh, I don't know, not at all semi-simple. It's not a, a rigorous oh, statement. It's just oh, a oh not, yeah, yeah, okay. not semi-simple. Um, let me just say in this in this example. Let me just go back to this example that the, these uh, nearby cycles, I don't know, let's say SP, okay, has, it's a very familiar sheaf. I mean, it's a kind of quadratic, I don't know, Morse degeneration. And it has a very, you know, it has a kind of um, Jordan Holder series where it has like intersection cohomology of the, the uh, singular point and then intersection cohomology of the whole thing. I don't know, uh, MP 
and then intersection cohomology of the singular point. Uh, it's an interesting sheaf. I mean, okay, I don't know. All sheaves are interesting, but in any case, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's a complicated sheaf. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Um, okay. Yeah. So um, so I think. Okay, so I think that's what I wanted to tell you about results as far as part one, but I wanted to give you a sense of where, of, of what, uh, how we prove this. I mean, where, where does the proof come from? I don't think I'll you know, go into detail, but I want to give you some sense and then shift to part two. Okay, so this is going to be a kind of uh, some comments on a source of uh, proof of the theorems. So I'll just say say a few words and then and then continue on. So the um, so uh, yeah so the it's kind of maybe typical in mathematics. I don't know. You, we we had some very complicated proofs involving what will appear in part two. In other words, involving affine Grassmannians and so on. But then it turns out that there are very simple proofs involving uh, just some hyperkähler geometry that are very very beautiful. Okay. So the idea is to um, is to consider hyperkähler hyperkähler symmetries. I don't know. I put that in quotes because I'm not sure if there's some kind of better phrasing for it. But a hyperkähler symmetries of um, of hyperkähler quotients quotients of affine spaces. Okay. So let me just give a kind of uh, quick uh, sketch of what I mean by this. Okay, so we um, we uh, the setup is you start with say um, v some uh, quaternionic uh, representation of a compact group. So let me call this compact group H C. Okay, so it's just the comp maximal compact in some complex group H. Okay. And uh, maybe not call, let me not call it V, let me call it M. I think that might be more traditional. Anyway, so this is a quaternionic representation. And I want to also assume it's a unitary in a very strong sense. So it has an inner product that's Hermitian for all of the three possible uh, complex structures on this uh, vector space. So this is a vector space over the quaternions. So it has an operator I, J, and K. And you want to be able to think about doing, you know, think of it as a complex representation, uh, how to say it, a unitary representation in all i, j, and k for the same inner product. Okay. Now with this uh, setup, you get a um, you get a, uh, a Hamiltonian reduction. I don't know m. Let's call it m equals mu inverse of zero mod h c where mu is the moment map going from M to the um, imaginary part of the quaternions tensor the dual of the Lie algebra. Okay, so it is kind of three moment maps in one. There's a moment map for I, a moment map for J. I mean, there are three Kähler forms and there's a moment map for each of them. And you set all of them equal to, to zero and uh, take the quotient, okay? Now the idea, so, uh, and then I'll kind of go into more examples is the idea, idea is, um, is that often uh, uh, M has evident symmetries, symmetries that descend to less evident symmetries of, I guess I say M again. Of, a fancy app. Okay, so that's exactly what happens when we we prove this theorem. So let me let me give a kind of example of this setup. So a kind of well known example of the setup is um, we can think about quiver varieties. The quiver varieties, in particular, I can consider the quiver that looks like say uh, as one, two, three, up to n, and then. Okay, so maybe I have operators. I'll give myself vector spaces c, c squared, c cubed, so on, c to the n. Then I have framing, say c to the n. Uh, and I give myself maps going back and forth. Okay, so I'm kind of usual Nakajima quiver variety. 
And uh, let's see, so these maps uh, have names X and Y, okay, so all the way through. And maybe let's call this one little y and little x. Okay, so okay, so with this setup, where let me uh, just trying to sketch a kind of picture that I imagine is familiar to many people. So we have uh, you know unitary groups acting on all of these, and so therefore acting on the space of um, therefore acting on the space of operators between these. Okay. So maybe y1, x1, and so on, y2, x2. Okay, so we have the space of all operators. So that's our quaternionic vector space. And then the group U, or uh, sorry, H compact, H compact is the product of these groups. Okay, and we form the, the reduction. And in this case, the, um, if you take you know, M, uh, which is mu inverse of zero mod, HC, this will be equivalent to the nilpotent cone for uh, SLM. Okay, so that's a kind of uh, example we use and that uh, I think is very familiar uh, to, to experts. So the idea is that, uh, just to go back to uh, how we construct these homeomorphisms, is that they're not at all evident I mean, I, I still don't have explicit formulas a lot of the time for uh, these homeomorphisms on nilpotent cones, but you can write down very explicit formulas on the vector spaces that the nilpotent cones are Hamiltonian reductions of. Okay, so that's, that's a kind of uh, theme here. Um, okay, so um, let me illustrate this uh, just with a, with a kind of, um, baby example or kind of toy toy example. So this is not really an example of the theorem in the sense that this is not how this case is proved. But let me just, uh, what there's some story that every talk should have a proof. Okay, so let me give you a, a, a proof here. So let's, let's, uh, let's prove the theorem. Let's prove the first theorem. First theorem for SL2. Okay, so what are we trying to prove? We're trying to prove that this real nilpotent cone is homeomorphic to these nodal lines, okay? So the idea is let's uniformize this picture. Let's recall that these, okay, so these are inside of, okay, I don't know, the complex SL2C, okay? So here this was, I don't know, SL2R, uh, I should think, was the input. Okay, so we know that SL2C, the nilpotent cone of SL2C is isomorphic to C2 mod Z mod two. Okay. So our linear space that we want to study, this is a C2 is the, is we can think of as a linear quaternionic space. Okay, so this is H, okay. And now inside of H, inside of C2, we can look on the one hand, on this side, we can look at the real line, uh, sorry, the R2 union I R2. Okay, so the reals union the imaginaries. Okay, and then over here on this side, inside C2, we can look at, uh, let me just write some formula that maybe is. Um, Uh, we can look at the two lines given by y equals ix and y equals minus ix. Okay. And it's not difficult, it's a good linear algebra exercise to show that these two lines can be kind of rotated or related by rotation. Okay, so you can rotate these two real subspace, I mean, real and imaginary subspace to the these two complex lines. Okay, so that's a I mean, maybe it's obvious uh, in any case, but if you disrespect the complex structure, you can do that. And now what you can see is under this map from C2 to C2 mod Z mod 2, which is just given by say XY goes to uh, the matrix uh, XY minus XY, let's see, minus Y squared X squared. Okay? So under this map, what you'll see is that, for example, this subspace R2 will go to this. Okay. And then this other subspace 
will go to here. Okay. And then of course, these will go to the, the lines there. Okay, so, so each of these lines will double cover one of the lines in the no potent cover. So the point is something completely obvious in this vector space becomes uh, kind of much more complicated when you just do a simple thing as a Z mod two quotient. Okay, so that's the proof of the, uh, I mean, I, I don't know. <laughs> I guess you can prove it just by hand. But in any case, that's a kind of in the spirit of the proof, the idea that you can do lots of things uh, before taking quotients that are evident and then they become quite interesting after taking quotients. Okay, so that ends what I had planned for part one, which now we're like 35 minutes or so. I don't know, uh, I, I imagine we're not taking breaks. Um, uh, but I'm happy to field questions or to take a break if anyone wants. So I will, otherwise I'll move on and talk about affine groups and some, some related geometry um, and uh, try, to, try to reach some application to what people call relative Langlands. So that's kind of where I hope to get to, but probably won't. But let me pause and see, are there any questions before I, I continue on? It's kind of very uncanny to sit in your house and sort of talk math to yourself. I don't know. Uh... <laughs> I didn't really get how your um, example was. So, I mean, in your equiv variety example, I didn't yeah. get why it was quaternionic. Ah, so what's, uh, yeah, so I, maybe I went very quickly, but what's quaternionic here is the, the um, if you, collect all of these operators into a big linear space. That linear space is, a, is naturally a quaternionic vector space. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the, the, I don't know, regular like M, un, unscript M. Mm -hmm. So that's a, that's a big quaternionic space. Um, and like, you know, you can, well, anyway, that's a big quaternionic space. And has, I mean, it's maybe it's, it's life as a quaternionic space is not evident if you think of this purely from the complex point of view, but it has a kind of a many more symmetries than you might have expected. Uh, can I ask a question? Please, of course, yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, so by the, this uh, equivalence of category from the uh, real side to the complex side. Um, yeah. Mm. So on the real form may be disconnected, right? The, the real Yeah, form. I make no, that's right, that's right. So how do you see this, uh, this component from the complex side? I mean, so the, for example, the topology of K is, the, is uh, K and GR are homotopy equivalent. So if GR is disconnected, then K is disconnected as well. Oh, oh yeah. So, so I should say this, this kind of, I don't know, what I'm writing down is a, is a homeomorphism. There, there's no kind of, this isn't an interesting equivalence in the sense that mathematics now likes equivalences that like, you know, mix and match different things. This is a kind of very, very direct equivalence. It's saying literally these two spaces are the same. So, um, oh, yeah. and yeah. the groups are the same. <coughs> yeah. Um, so, Okay, so let me say one thing for me that's a kind of motivation that now I'll, I'll kind of move on to part two. One thing that's kind of motivation for me is there's many, many places where one sees um, uh, geometry over a non-algebraically closed field behaving like geometry over an algebraically closed field. Okay, so here we see that uh, the, no -potent, the real null potent cone is equivalent to a complex, you know, symmetric no potent cone. And that tells you that its geometry is going to satisfy all of the Hodge theory and other things that you, you know, know you have over an algebraically closed field. So one theme that I think I, I mentioned at the very beginning that I think is relevant to modular representation theory is this idea that you can often uh, take advantage of, of this, uh, this kind of strange identities between non-algebraically closed and algebraically closed geometry. Okay. David, can I just ask yeah. one question? Please, of course, yeah. Hi. If we look at your example and your toy example, so mm. like the quiver variety description and then this C2 mod Z mod two, yeah. how, are, how are they related? Is this C2 they're mod not. two? 
Yeah, I didn't. <laughs> yeah, no, that, that's why I called it toy. Ex I don't know. I didn't mean to mean it's mis yeah, it's kind of it's it, that's why I wrote toy example, hoping, you, you know, that would convey something. Yeah. So this is a fake. This is not how our proof works for SL2, but it's the only way I can in finite time explain something, you know, draw a picture of something. So, I mean, you know, this is one of these things where SL2 is incredibly special in that the, you know, symmetric square of the standard representation is the adjoint. Like that's some, that's what allows you to write down the toy example, whereas you don't, I mean, I would love to know a kind of analog of this. It probably doesn't exist or else people would have found it long ago. But in any case, yeah. So this is a kind of a, a different route to SL2 than kind of a toric route to SL2. So, yeah, thanks. So yeah, sorry if that was confusing. Okay, so um, okay, so now part two. Okay, and like I said, it's kind of funny. Part two for us came chronologically before part one, and then we slowly kind of sanded away all the things we didn't understand until we arrived at like uh, kind of what I just described. So here, the 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 starting point is the loop group. So we'll look at the the loop group, um, and uh, inside of it we have. Okay, I don't know how much notation to remind people of. We have the arc group. And I just want to say enough so that I can say that the Grassmannian is the loop group modulo the, the arc group. Um, okay, and now I want to see what happens when I give myself this, uh, this real form. Okay, so I, I start life again with a real form. And so the analog of the kind of uh, diagram I wrote at the beginning is the following. So I can start with, um, the polynomial loop group. And then inside of it, I can look at uh, LGR. Okay, so let me kind of draw some picture of what's going on here. So um, this polynomial loop group are maps from GM. And maybe I draw GM like, like kind of a plane. Okay, so here's maps from the punctured uh, complex line to G, okay. And inside of all those maps, I can look at those maps that send the circle to the real form, and that's LGR. Okay, so LGR is what you would expect if you're a topologist, and I told you I'm saying the loop group of the real form. I happen to be studying some polynomial model of it, but it really is just maps that uh, from the circle to GR that extend to polynomial maps to the whole thing. Okay, and I similarly have LGC. And then I can consider likewise K of T, T inverse, and then L, K, R. Okay, so we have the same diagram, but now for, for loop groups. Okay, and I'm just trying to get as, as quickly as I can to a statement. Um, okay, so let me go for the kind of lowest hanging statement I can. So inside of GR, let's, uh, the Grassmannian, let's consider uh, Grassmannian zero, which will be G of T inverse times the base point of the Grassmannian times one. So this is what you might call the kind of open uh, Schubert co, uh, Schubert variety, I don't know, Schubert co uh, stratum. Okay, uh, and we can think of this, if you like, as uh, maps from A1, comma zero to G comma one. Okay, so they're maps of pairs. They are maps from A1 to G that take zero to, um, to uh, the identity. Okay, so now the theorem, uh, and here there's no, let me just say in part two, there's no assumption on G being of classical type. Okay, so everything I'll say here is kind of completely general. So this is continuing joint work. Um, so there here, there's a KR, equivariant stratified homeomorphism uh, from the real form of this open Schubert cell to uh, the symmetric form, okay? So let me say a word about the stratification. I, here I have in mind that I intersect with the um, Schubert strata, the usual, maybe I say Schubert or spherical Spherical strata. Okay. 
So this is a kind of local model of the geometry of the spherical strata in the Grassmannian. And I take on the one hand, a real form of it. On the other hand, a symmetric form of it. And they're, they're uh, homeomorphic. So for me, this was a big, um, um, I don't know, this piece of satisfaction because uh, I had spent a lot of time thinking about the real form and noticing that it has a lot of, uh, the geometry behaves a lot of times like complex geometry. And this theorem was kind of the, finally a kind of clear uh, minded way of seeing why. Okay, so, um, so I want to give you some idea of how we show this, because I think the idea of how we show this is as interesting as the assertion. And then I want to, uh, if I have a minute, I'll, I'll say some application to some aspect of relative Langlands. Sorry, okay. could you just explain the definition of this symmetric form? I didn't- Yeah, know. okay, so yeah. So um, if you, uh, maybe I will just guide you towards, if you like this uh, realization. So I think of these as like, if we, G is SLN, and these are matrices with you know polynomial entries. And now inside of SLN, I can of course consider, uh, okay, maybe you asked about the symmetric one. So I can consider uh, those matrices that are symmetric and just ask for the maps to lie in them. Okay, so it's, there's no, it's not like a sophisticated construction. Um, you, can, you can identify this also with uh, G of T inverse mod K of T inverse, if you like, like if you wanna think about it that way. Um, Okay, so in other words, it's kind of robust. I think any way you want to define it, uh, you know, in a reasonable way, it'll be what I intend. So, uh, and the real one is just what you expect. All the, everything should be real. Um, okay. Um, okay. So let me say kind of the kind of idea, uh, idea of arguments. Okay. So what we do is, and here I, I kind of will run out of time, no doubt, but let me, let me just say that, the, that we're going to work with uh, quasi-maps, quasi-maps on P1. So let me remind you what a quasi-map is. Okay, so if X is a curve like P1, okay, and S inside X is some subset, finite subset, okay, and G is a group, and y is a g variety, okay? So then there's a moduli called the quasi-maps. Let's see, how do I want to, okay, there's lots of different notations, quasi-maps x, s, or y, okay? And what are these? Okay, so there's lots of different ways to think about them, but let me just tell you what they parameterize. So it's a g bundle, uh, say p, on x with, a section over X minus S of the associated Y bundle. Okay, okay. Um, so this is a kind of standard definition now. And let me just comment that if uh, Y equals G mod K, so it's G mod a subgroup K as will be relevant to us, then we have, this is the same thing as a G bundle uh, P on X with a K reduction over X minus S. Okay, so what we're going to be interested in are quasi maps on the following. Uh, so, well, let me just say, so there's also, also, uh, also can uh, form, yeah, can form real forms of quasi maps. Okay, so let me say what we're going to be interested in. So we're gonna look at P1 okay, and we're gonna look at S being two points, let's call them I and minus I, okay? And we'll think of the conjugation. So we'll think of real form with a real conjugation that flips the you know, upper half space and the lower half space and flips I and minus I, okay? And if we take this whole setup and study real quasi-maps, okay? So let me just say that uh, I'll write this as quasi-maps real, okay? 
So we take real quasi maps uh, into, um, yeah, uh, real quasi maps. Oh yeah, so, so, so sorry, let me say, uh, let me get myself just a little more room. So let's take x equal to p1 uh, and y equal to g mod k. Okay, so this is a symmetric subgroup. Okay, so then we can study uh, real quasi maps and this space of real quasi maps will be isomorphic to the Grassmannian modulo LKR. Okay, so, um, so whether quasi maps were a good idea or not, at the end of the day, what you're studying when you're studying quasi maps for this setup is you're taking the complex Grassmannian and studying the orbits of loops in this compact uh, real form. And now what we're going to do is we're going to consider two different degenerations. We're going to consider what happens when, on the one hand, we allow the two pole points to collide into, say, the point zero. Okay, we still have this kind of real conjugation. Okay, still have P1. And now when we study quasi maps, what we find is the real Grassmannian divided by KR. Okay, and in fact, we prove that this degeneration is topologically trivial. So theorem, theorem, this is topologically trivial. Okay, so there's no difference in the geometry between this generic uh, space of quasi maps and this uh, special fiber. Okay, so that's one degeneration. Now, the other degeneration that we'll study is a nodal degeneration of P1 itself. So here, I don't know whether to label the points I and minus I anymore, they're on different components. But now, one thing that I think is really, really interesting is that you've decoupled the conjugation from the curve. So now the conjugation is acting freely on the curve, except for at the node point. So the only part of the geometry that's going to be real algebraic is geometry at the node. All of the rest of the geometry, the Galois group is acting freely, so it'll still have complex flavor. Okay, so, and what do we find here? So if we here, we take real quasi maps. So, well, at least let me tell you that over the open locus where the bundle is trivial, okay, so trivial uh, underlying bundle P, okay, this quasi map space is uh, isomorphic to this open symmetric thing mod KR. And we also prove that this, well, okay, so maybe I should also put inside of here, quasi maps open. Okay, so this is GR open mod LK, uh, how to write that? That doesn't look right. Okay, let me write it this way. So let me write this. So this is um, so theorem, independent theorem. Sorry, I don't mean to keep writing our names. I just don't want to forget Sashen. So uh, independent theorem, this is, um, is topologically trivial uh, over trivial bundles. Okay, so, so the left-hand side now is this symmetric Grassmannian and the right-hand side is this real Grassmannian. And so the theorem comes about not by I don't know, here there's no hypercalar geometry rotations. Maybe there is secretly and I just don't understand it yet. Here the theorem is really about degenerating different moduli spaces. And what I think for me, what I think is really uh, relevant to people interested in non-algebraically closed fields is this idea that if you take a curve that has an interesting Galois group action, you can degenerate it to a curve where the Galois action is, is kind of nearly free. And this is something, or, or you know, if you take marked points that you can uh, generalize the marked points so that the Galois action is free. So people, uh, I know certainly people in this audience study, uh, you know, cyclic configurations of points with, uh, you know, degenerating. And here it's the same idea. It's just we're interested in the real geometry rather than maybe 
some uh, cyclic root geometry. Okay, so, um, so that's some idea and there's maybe lots to say. So let me go just in the last couple of minutes, let me go for a particular application that I think is, is fun. And that again has the flavor of real geometry helping you understand complex geometry, which is a kind of, uh, kind of strange situation. Okay, so let me say something very brief in the last couple minutes about an application. Let me spell app application um, to uh, what people call now relative Langlands. And um, I think there's a long history of what people call relative Langlands and people have thought about this. The people that I'm learning this from in real time as they discover more and more beautiful things are uh, David Benzvi, um, Giannis Sakela, I'm not sure of the spelling, and Akshay Venkatesh. And again, I'm not mentioning their names to uh, give priority to many of the other people who have thought about it, but they're the people who I'm learning this from. So in any case, um, I, I owe it to them for explaining, explaining some things. So the idea there is one basic, a basic challenge. I mean, among many, many other things that they're interested in, a basic challenge is to give a, what you could call a spherical Satake. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, you take the Grassmannian and then you take say H of T. Okay, so maybe I, I guess I write this as loops, loops in H, where H is uh, inside G is some spherical subgroup say. Okay. And then they want to understand the category of this and prove it's equant to some, you know, spectral description. Okay, so this is a kind of basic challenge in, in, this, uh, in this game is to give a kind of spectral description for a kind of spherical Sadaki category. Okay, so let me point out a kind of uh, special case, special case that this geometry I've been discussing is relevant to. So H equals K, a symmetric subgroup, okay, is, uh, is a special case. And now if we are interested in the geometry of GR mod LK, let's see if I can find, let me just put a, a kind of a box around it. Um, it's not, completely obvious, but this isomorphism tells you that this geometry, okay, sorry, I went very quickly, but the, it tells you that the geometry of K orbits on the Grassmannian is going to be, uh, this is equivalent as a corollary of our results is equivalent to um, uh, taking the real Grassmannian and looking at the usual spherical geometry. Okay, so usual spherical geometry of the real Grassmannian. Okay, now, okay, so you haven't made much progress in the sense that you traded complex geometry for real geometry, which is typically much kind of harder to, to, to understand, but let me mention a kind of uh, an example where this has a payoff, okay? So, so a payoff, so payoff uh, example. Uh, and then, I mean, there's more structural things that I think are, are relevant to this, but a payoff example is that um, if we take GR equal to, I guess, okay, I don't know the best uh, notation for this. I think it's what, what people call SU star two N, I don't know. Okay, so, uh, so the point is that Whatever this is, the real Grassmannian in this case is equal to what you would call the uh, quaternionic Grassmannian of SLM. Okay. okay, so it's a Grassmannian. So if you're familiar thinking about the complex Grassmannian, it's a Grassmannian that looks exactly like the complex Grassmannian, but anywhere where you put like a complex space, you put the quaternionic version of it. 
Okay, so it's like a first minimal stratum is, uh, is a quaternionic projective space whose topology is very easy to understand. So as a, as a corollary of this, you can prove the kind of uh, spherical sataki in this case. And let me just say, I have no idea how you would prove it starting with the kind of this description. Once you go to the real form, it becomes completely evident that it's just quaternionic geometry, which is in fact much easier topologically than complex geometry. Okay, so um, yeah, I think I've gone a couple minutes over time. So I thank you for your patience. I'll stop there. And of course, happy to uh, answer questions, chat, uh, whatever is useful. So thank you, David, for your talk. Does anyone have any questions for David? In, in general, is there anything one can say about this like uh, real, uh, like spherical satake category for the real affine Grassmannian? Or is that just not known? This one. Yeah. Yeah, so, okay, so I, in my, so one reason I, I'm very happy always talking about this is because this is what I studied in my thesis. So it's like, know. you know, when you, 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 you know, what do they say? Like you, um, uh, you know, there are certain problems. It's, it's kind of, okay, so let, let me, t okay, this is kind of just a personal note. So when I was a grad student, there were two things that I really, really wanted to understand. And one of them I half understood, and that was the geometry of this real spherical story. So, what I was able to understand is that there's a Tanakhian category in this complicated geometry that is equivalent to representations of some subgroup of the Langlands dual group. And that's relevant, of course, to understanding the whole category. But what I never could understand was what is the whole category? And now these, the experts are, are proposing, uh, they, there are proposals for what these whole categories are. So, I mean, they're doing it in the context of general spherical varieties, but if you translate it through these kind of equivalences that Saoshan and I proved, then it means something for this real geometry. So I'm very excited to, to sort of get back into this game because to me, it was always after this Tanakhian category, I didn't know what else one could say. So the answer to your question is I know no more than I knew, you know, I sad to say 20 years ago, <laughs> I don't know, you know, so, so about that. Um, let me mention the other thing that it was a kind of a problem always in my mind that motivates a lot of what we're doing. So I am very, very interested in representation theory of real loop groups. So this subject doesn't currently exist. So representation theory of complex loop groups is a beautiful subject. There's highest weight categories. There's you know all of the kind of beautiful algebraic theory is there. Representation theory of compact loop groups, meaning loops in compact groups, behaves exactly as we expect from finite groups. So there's borel weil bott and there's all the sort of beautiful geometry. But if I say loops in SL2R, there's essentially like very, very little in terms of a Harish Chandra style theory. So the reason Saoshan and I started to think about these things again is we're really interested in representation theory of real loop groups. It should be relevant to a lot of interesting geometry, but it just like doesn't exist. Like it's not like how to say it, you know, it's not like the theory doesn't exist. I don't even know like how to write down individual representations. <laughs> you know, it's like there's clearly numerically should be a theory there, but it's not even like there's an example yet. So that's, uh, I don't know. So there were two things as a grad student I always wanted to understand. I understood half of one and now somehow I'm trying to get back into that game again. So I have a comment. Mm, uh, I think it would be very interesting to look at what happens on the real uh, varieties, but with coefficients modulo two, and see the relation. Because uh, sorry, and which varieties? I just like uh, either Springer theory in the real case. Ah, ah, I see. One, okay. But taking modulo two coefficients, so I thought about this because um, when I saw the structure of the the analog of the Springer shift for uh, hmm. NP, for yeah. SP, it, it was length three, so it's exactly what happens for. Modular Springer theory. That's right. Yeah. In the nilpotent cone. So if you take uh, coefficients of the sheaves uh, modulo two. Right. Uh, and so there is a Smith theory. So you 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 can apply Smith theory for 
the cyclic group of, of order two, basically, the right. conjugation. Uh, so yeah, I would like to discuss more with you. Of course, I mean, let, let me say that I think you'll, you'll uh, I mean, this, this, you know, spherical Sataki has, uh, again, I advertise, it has a lot of feel of modular representation theory. It's definitely a very non-semi-simple situation. And we know in the symmetric case, it's equivalent to this real story, which has a lot of the flavor of this modular story in that you sometimes have decomposition theorem for certain maps, but not for other maps. Anyway, so I don't say that there's like, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a literal logical connection, but if you like this kind of geometry, I think it, you know, it, it would be fun to think about. Can I just say one thing that we've seen um, in, a, in a few different circumstances, just following up from Danielle's comment, hmm. is that there's like a space, a complex space, rational coefficients, and we have, um, so for example, we work out IC stalks and we work out that they, um, they satisfy parity vanishing. And let's say the stalks are in degrees one, like the, the dimensions are like one, zero, two, zero, one or something. Hmm. And now there's another space where if we take mod two coefficients, this gets collapsed right down. Um, and that's exactly, I, yeah. I mean, the re, you know, if I were to give you the, naivest summary of what's happening in the real case. The geometry is the same, except everything's getting collapsed by a half. <laughs> and th this is why, I mean, this is why this, like for low hanging fruit, you know, this, this guy is like the geometry is getting multiplied by two. So <laughs> it's like double parity. You know? <laughs> so that's why I said to Daniel, like, it's, it's not like I know a kind of, well, I'm sure that there's theoretical reasons for this, but it certainly has the same feeling. Like if you enjoy this kind of geometry, then there's something here, I think, that uh, could be worth looking at. Well, I, I, I'm trying to get more aware recently, but <laughs> yeah. I've been complex all, all my life. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, my, you know, it's funny, my entry, I, you know, was not motivated by real, but rather motivated by symmetric spaces. So the first one of the things I learned as a grad student was how to think about loop groups in terms of uh, you know Morse theory due to Bott. And his Morse theory, of course, you, you should think about symmetric spaces at the same time as groups. Like in fact, to see periodicity, you need to think about both at the same time. And uh, these real Grassmannians are models of loops and symmetric spaces. So. Um, anyway, so I, and I think this relative Langlands program is, is telling people that like somehow the spherical varieties are really good objects. Like, you know, don't stop at groups, like somehow, like keep going, you know, go, spherical varieties are worth your, worth your time. Like I didn't get in the end your payoff example. So can you actually describe what that category is in that example? Yeah, so maybe I just, uh, let's see. So I draw a picture for SL2 that will, uh, you'll know immediately what I'm talking about, I think. Okay, so, so, um, ah, so, okay, so maybe, sorry, I could answer your question kind of scientifically and that I could tell you the spectral side in this case. Okay, so maybe that's a kind of most, side. let me, let me tell you to that. So, so, so um, we know the spectral side for derived Sataki in the complex case, thanks to Bezrukovnikov and collaborators um, so we know that the uh, complex case, what I would write is something like D, well, all right, let's, I, I don't want to worry about bounded and so on, but let me just write this and you'll know to put the correct, you know, technical assumptions in the correct places. So you write something like, um, okay, I don't know, there's a check and then maybe a dual or maybe not a dual. Okay, I, I don't remember where, whether I should put duals. What about three or four talks about this? So um, everybody can put the checks and the duals. Okay, yeah, so, so, so maybe there's a dual. Okay, yeah, so, so you, you know, I, I was told, so when I, uh, well, anyway, I'm reminiscing a lot, I don't know, when I was a, so I was a student of Bob McPherson, so I spent a lot of time at IAS, and he warned me that if you went to ask Deline a question, he, and you got your weights and your co-weights confused, he would send you away to like, uh, make sure you could formulate your question properly. So I don't know, <laughs> okay, anyway, I don't remember if there's a dual, but uh, the rough idea, so let me kind of make this more, a little bit more precise. The rough idea is something like, okay, there's a plus or minus. Okay, so I hope that looks like something you guys have seen in talk. I mean, I know that there's a modular version of this afoot, 
anyway, so this, this I hope looks familiar. So, uh, so this is kind of a complex um, uh, derived Satake. Okay, and now this kind of quaternionic Satake that I'm describing is, this is the least exciting thing I think I could say, but I put a four here. <laughs> okay, so that's the most scientific answer to your question, Jordi, and that it doesn't convey anything except, I mean, that is the answer that at the end of the day you will prove. The point though, I think to give you a flavor of the geometry is like if we say start with SL2 and we start studying the Grassmannian for SL2, the first orbit is a P1. Now your usual P1 is over the complex numbers, but in this quaternionic version, it should be over the quaternions. So it's a four sphere. Now you convolve this four sphere with itself and you get a one point compactification of the cotangent bundle of the four sphere. Yeah. And so all of your parity results are now shifted, uh, you know, as uh, by four, anyway, two, two, they've expanded. So, mm -hmm. so I, you know, there's a whole theory, I don't know it very well, but there's a theory from physics about hyperkähler geometry having certain, I don't know, anywhere, geometry that's built out of four spheres instead of two spheres. Uh, so this is not the most, I don't know how, to, I, I just wanted some concrete payoff. This, what I think is the payoff is that it, it's not clear if you go back to the kind of, uh, you know, spherical description that this category would have such a nice, uh, I only can see this when I go to this kind of real side. So, okay, anyway, that's an answer. Can I ask just, a, I mean, something vague, more philosophical mm -hmm. related to what you said at the end? Uh, I mean, there's this other Atiyah Bialeski uh, work trying to uh, uh, understand quite unique structures, but on, on, on usual uh, complex. Uh, objects of uh, complex uh, groups, uh, and you see, I mean, is there is there a reason why I mean this shows up, and is there any anything relating these two worlds, uh, the normal complex world where some quaternionic structure like in Springer Westmont shows up, and what you're doing, which is groups over quaternions? Yeah. So, um, so, so for example, would okay. I don't know the theory you mentioned, but like for example, would the fact that uh, nilpotent orbits are quaternionic. I mean, are hyperkähler. Is that is that an example of that? That's exactly. Yeah, that's part of the yeah part of the Yalisky ID. Yes. Yeah. So right. So the um, yeah. So so um, okay. So I'll give you what the kind of concrete comment is that as soon as you ever see a um, as soon as you ever see a uh, hyperkähler thing quaternions are of course there like not in the geometry of this how to say it, not at in the definition of the moduli of the space but in the um but in the symmetries of the space as we discussed like you 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 know you have some hyperkähler rotations on the complex structures and so on now my point of view my personal point of view is that now we're studying lie theory okay so we're saying okay our moduli spaces all come from linear algebra and so the um, so we're you know so at the end of the day there's what I think is the insight is there's kind of no difference these end structures that you want to see like hyperkähler structure only has one choice of where to come from originally if you're starting to if you're if you're you know everything starts from a linear space and that structure is you know a quaternionic vector space. So I have no doubt that you know it had to say it, like in okay. physics yeah. everything is the Hamiltonian reduction of some linear space. And if you want your eventual Hamiltonian reduction to be have some kind of quaternionic symmetry, I think you have no choice but to have it be a reduction of a quaternionic vector space. So, um, and I think it goes. Yeah, I think you It goes in the. Yeah, I think you answer some of answering my questions. That's okay. The origin should be when we observe a quaternionic things. That, some there should be a quaternionic origin. Uh, okay, no, I see what you mean. Thanks. Yeah, in fact, let me let me advertise a question that I, I don't at all know the answer to. So part one of the talk, so part one of the talk assumed we had classical groups. And that's simply due to the fact that we don't know of a description of exceptional Lie algebras as Hamiltonian reductions of vector spaces. Now, physics tells us that anything we possibly can write down should be the Hamiltonian reduction of some vector space. I mean, that's kind of, in physics, you start, I mean, typically the vector spaces are infinite dimensional, but then you write down some Hamiltonian reduction. 
So I think it would be a great breakthrough if someone could give a kind of construction of uniform construction, or maybe just exceptional by group by exceptional group, a construction of exceptional uh, you know, nilpotent cones and conjugacy classes and all these hyperkähler geometry uh, as a Hamiltonian reduction of some initial quaternionic ge you know, vector space. Because that's the place where the philosophy I'm suggesting, Raphael, is like, is, fail is not failing, but it's kind of has a gap in it. Like I'm saying like, okay, anything quaternionic and Lee theoretic should come originally from the Hamiltonian reduction of some, you know, quaternionic vector space, but we still don't know that for exceptional Lee algebras, at least to my knowledge. Okay, thanks. No, that's, that's illuminating. So that's maybe indeed the kind of things that uh, uh, Atia uh, was after in his work with uh, Bielski, yeah? trying to look for, yeah, for, uh, the roots of uh, quaternionic uh, uh, of these hyperkähler structures uh, um, yeah, that found out by Kronheimer uh, just before. Yeah. Exactly, it's not really satisfactory. I mean, th th that theory of Kronheimer and so on works kind of, you know, uh, what do you say, no potent orbit by no potent orbit. It really, if you look at the equations, they don't stitch together. I mean, it's really like you can't kind of clearly stitch them together. I think otherwise people would have produced a kind of homeomorphism long ago, like Michel Verne would have produced a kind of more than just an orbit by orbit uh, comparison. Um, so I still think there's some big gap in our understanding. And I've been told that, you know, the explosion of Coulomb branch theory, okay, just whatever that is as a black box, promises that there should be a, you know, a kind of direct construction of exceptional nilpotent cones as quaternionic reductions like that like the physics tells you that should clearly happen um, but it's not it hasn't yet happened uh, on this kind of topic in in like the work of Kapustin and Witten these f and grossmannian slices are realized as as a hyperkähler reductions of infinite dimensional vector spaces i think Right. I mean, I, I think I don't think anyone's tried to exploit that mathematically, have they? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, right. So, so Sashian and I discussed formally our constructions work whether you start in infinite dimensions or you know, like. But of course, it, it's a little bit kind of crazy to start in infinite dimensions. But I think physics-wise, kind of everything is a is a Hamiltonian reduction of some affine space of connections. You know, there's like, you know, so um, I don't know of any kind of. Yeah, I mean, I basically can repeat what you said, um, but uh, but yeah, I would really love you would make me very happy, uh, and I think would certainly discover something worthwhile if you found a kind of you know uniform exceptional uh, you know, Lie algebra picture in this way. So maybe to follow up on the Atia Bielowski paper. Um, at the end of the paper, they speculate that they can construct, they can give a new viewpoint on the uh, geometric construction of the affine Hecke algebra from their quaternionic geometry. And, uh, and so in their paper, they use some sort of triple product of the Cartan, um, modulo the diagonal action of the Val group. Um, and they, are, they argue something like, you have some SU2 action, and if you break symmetry and bring the symmetry down to S1, you can see the affine Heck algebra emerge where one of the parameters is your circle rotation coming from this symmetry breaking. And the rest is from like from projection onto one of the cartons where you get the usual spring resolution. I'm not doing a good job of explaining it, but um, it seems that uh, you, in your, at the beginning of your talk, you said that you got back Grinberg's description of the, the morphisms of the Springer sheaf. Um, and I was wondering if there's a K-theoretic uh, of the Springer sheaf and it's, it's cohomology, but at the level of, a, of, the, of some K-theory statement, which would see not just the endomorphisms of the sheaf, but some kind of right. algebra. And that's interesting. I mean, okay, yeah, so I don't know. Um, I mean, uh, so another topic I've been thinking about recently is, uh, yeah, I mean, is thinking of different ways to start with things like uh, Springer resolutions and Steinberg varieties and how to linearize them with different theories to get you different algebras. 
um, I haven't thought about that at all in this situation. So, I mean, uh, so I don't know, but, um, but there's, yeah, there, um, okay, yeah, I, I, it, I agree, it's interesting, I don't, but I don't know anything. Um, also, there's on the topic of no potent orbits for exceptional type. Um, so there's a remark by, I think, Berlinski and Kostan uh, that says that one can think of some no potent orbit closures as if they're independent of the group. So the example they give is like, um, for the minimal no potent orbit closure in G2, hmm. um, uh, you, can, you can look at this orbit as a no potent orbit closure for SL3. Um, and maybe there's a way to reduce the exceptional case to the classical case oh. by comparing different orbit closures. Maybe not the whole nipotent cone, but just individual orbit closures. I wonder yeah, if I mean, that's yeah, so, so, explain. That, yeah, that's interesting. I mean, so there's, I can say that we can prove, I, I know of, and maybe this is related to what you're, you're mentioning, that we can prove various partial results for exceptional Lie algebras because I didn't state them, but because I guess part of the nilpotent cone is accessible from types, you know, A, D, E, or, you know, A, D, or something like this. So I don't remember the yeah. details, but like maybe it's, you know, if you look inside the affine Grassmannian, uh, you can, for exceptional Lie algebras, you can find some part of the nilpotent cone, not all of it. I don't know. Anyway, I'm not an expert, but uh, I know there are people in the audience who thought a lot about this. Um, I can imagine. Um, yeah, I can say we didn't try to push through in the name of obtaining results. So it's possible that one can prove the things. We, we stopped at like, what was the low hanging kind of easy, I don't know, structured theory. Um, so it's possible one can, can prove for exceptional Lie algebras. I guess I'm a kind of holdout. I really want you to tell me how to construct, you know, the nil potent cone for an exceptional Lie algebra in some very clean modular moduli theoretic way. Like I want to know it's, I don't know. <laughs> if I knew, I would I tell you. <laughs> I see, thank you. So, so it's kind of maybe more aesthetic uh, or maybe it's just the laziness that we didn't try to kind of push through as far as we could. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank um, David again for his oh, talk. Thanks. <laughs> so now, now, unfortunately, I go and I do office hours. That's uh, <laughs> for linear algebra. <laughs> so, yeah, so I, uh, it's uh, it's funny in the in the class I'm teaching, the students get very very scared if the if the you know we talk about complex vector spaces rather than real vector spaces. I try, you know, I try to convey, convey to them the real case is harder, but <laughs> they're not. <laughs> <kidding. So. laughs> Okay, anyway, thanks. I, I will actually- I'll Don't go. tell them about quaternions, okay? Yeah. <laughs> anyway, they just had a midterm. So it's gonna be, a, it's a, this is the last of um, the happy part of my day. The rest of my day is, uh, anyway, thanks again for including me. I had, I had a good time, thanks.